first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Global Bicycle Tours, may I help you? Yes, thank you. I'd like to sign up for a bicycle tour. Which tour were you interested in? We have the River Valley Tour coming up in June and the Mountain Tour in July. The River Valley Tour is in June. I thought it was in May. It actually takes place the first week of June. Oh, I see. Well, I can still do that. The River Valley Tour is the one I want. Splendid. Just let me take your information. May I have your name, please? Carla Schmidt. That's Carla with a K, not a C. K-A-R-L-A. -A. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Address? Do you need a street address, or can I give you my post office box? A post office box is fine. It's P.O. Box 257, Manchester. Thank you. OK, next. Will you be bringing your own bicycle, or do you want to rent one from us? I'll bring my own. Excellent. Now, we provide all the meals, so we need to know if you have any dietary restrictions. I don't think so. What do you mean? I mean, if there's any food you can't eat. Some people have food allergies or are vegetarian or have to avoid dairy products, things like that. Oh, I see. Well, yes, I'm a vegetarian. I never eat meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. All right, I'll make a note of that. Now, the total cost of the tour is $750. That much? The price includes everything. Food, hotel, transportation, everything. Everything? Yes, everything. The only other thing is you'll want to tip the tour guide. We usually recommend 5% of the total tour cost. A 5% tip? I guess that's reasonable. In order to reserve your space on the tour, I'll need a 30% deposit. Do you need that right away? We generally ask for the deposit at least four weeks before the tour begins. The River Valley tour begins, let me see, six weeks from now. So you'll need to pay the deposit in two weeks. I think I can do that. I wonder if you could tell me something. How will our luggage be transported? Do we carry it on our bicycles? No, you leave that to us. We have a van that carries your luggage from hotel to hotel each day, so you don't have to worry about it. Great. I have a luggage rack for my bike, but I guess I won't have to bring that. No, you won't. But there are a few items we recommend that you bring. We can't control the weather, so you should bring a raincoat or rain gear. Yes, that's a good idea. And I should have my own spare tyre too, shouldn't I? Actually, you don't need that, as our guide always carries some. And of course, you won't need maps either, since our guide has the route all planned. What about a water bottle? I'll need that, won't I? Yes, you should definitely have a water bottle. A camera would be a good idea too, since that tour goes through some very scenic areas. I have a guidebook of that area. I wonder if I should bring it along. We don't recommend guidebooks. It would just be extra weight, and the tour guide knows a great deal about the area. Yes, I see. Is there anything else I need to know? I think we've covered the important points. I'll send you a tour brochure, and you can call again if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about employment interviews. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Today I have with me Sandy Richardson of the Local Workforce Center, and she'll be talking about that critical step towards the goal of employment, the interview. Sandy, what is an interview for, and what's the best way to approach it? A job interview is simply a meeting between you and a potential employer to discuss your qualifications and see if there is a fit. The employer wants to verify what they know about you and talk about your qualifications. If you have been called for an interview, you can assume that the employer is interested in you. The employer has a need that you may be able to meet, so it's your goal to identify that need and convince the employer that you're the one for the job. As everyone knows, interviews can be stressful, but when you're well prepared, there's no reason to panic. Preparation is the key to success in a job search, and you can begin by collecting together all the documents you may need for the interview, such as extra copies of your resume, lists of references, and letters of recommendation. You could also take some work samples, selecting from what you have designed, drawn, or written, for instance, and make sure you have a pen and pad of paper for taking notes. The next step is to find out about the post. The more you know about the job, the employer, and the industry, the better prepared you will be to target your qualifications. Always request a job description from the employer and research employer profiles at the Chamber of Commerce or local library. You could also try to network with people who work for the company or with employees of companies associated with it. The next step is to match your qualifications to the requirements of the job. A good approach is to write out your qualifications along with the job requirements. Think about some standard interview questions and how you might respond. Most questions are designed to find out more about you, your qualifications, or to test your reactions in a given situation. If you don't have any experience or skills in a required area, Think about how you might compensate for those deficiencies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. During an interview, it's important that you be yourself. Get a good night's sleep and plan your travel to be there in plenty of time so that you're not arriving out of breath with 30 seconds to spare. Don't, though, present yourself for the interview too early, 10 minutes at most. In the interview, listen carefully to each question asked. Take your time in responding and make sure your answers are positive. It's important to express a good attitude and show that you're willing to work, eager to learn, and are flexible. If you are unsure of a question, don't be afraid to ask for clarification. In fact, it's sometimes a good strategy to close a response with a question for the interviewer. In general, focus on your qualifications and look for opportunities to personalize the interview. Briefly answer questions with examples of how you responded in comparable situations from either your life or previous job experiences. Something you should avoid are yes or no responses to questions. 
but don't dwell too long on non-job-related topics. Use caution if you are questioned about your salary requirements. The best strategy is to avoid the question until you have been offered a job. Questions about salary asked before there is a job offer are usually screening questions that may eliminate you from consideration, so be warned. On the other hand, it isn't inappropriate to show your enthusiasm if your first impressions of the interview and of the employer are good ones. So, if the job sounds like what you are looking for, say so. Keep in mind that the interview is not over when you are asked if you have any questions. Come prepared to ask a couple of specific questions that again show your knowledge and interest in the job. Close the interview in the same friendly, positive manner in which you started. When the interview is over, leave promptly. Don't overstay your time. Think about the interview and learn from the experience. Evaluate the success and failures. The more you learn from the interview, the easier the next one will become. You'll become much more confident. To close, here are a few more tips. First, Maintain good eye contact throughout the interview and be aware of nonverbal body language. Second, dress a step above what you would wear on the job. Go to the hairdressers, have a shave, etc. Remember that your appearance is a key indicator of whether you have the right attitude, so it can pay to give some thought to how you look. And finally, don't be a clock watcher. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at, uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but your spelling. I know, I know. But I'm working on a foreign computer. The spell checker doesn't work for English. Are you sure? Have you tried changing the setting to English? No, I haven't. Well, I should see if that's possible. I haven't marked you down this time, but, well, some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling. I'd try to get that sorted out if I were you. 
Okay, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Mm. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Yeah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Yeah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? Exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... <sighs> I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right, OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Many typically American characteristics, individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified, however. 1. Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. 2. Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships among people from other cultures. This has something to do with American mobility and the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people. Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. 3. Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless, uninformed or elementary. Someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. 4. Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events and may display ignorance of world geography. Because the US is not surrounded by many other nations, some Americans tend to ignore the world. 5. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation. 6. Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behaviour or want to know what makes Americans tick, do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners, observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you and therefore you with them. It is, of course, Impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. 1. Queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped, or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, Excuse me. 2. Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. 3. It is considered poor manners to slurp, chew noisily or open your mouth while chewing. 4. Questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, Religious affiliations and sex life are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. 5. Men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women and quite common between men and women. Now, a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the US, one must be aware of crimes. It is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following. 1. Do not walk alone at night. 2. When you leave your room, apartment or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked and all windows are secured. 3. Do not carry too much cash or wear jewellery of great value. 
Four. Never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. Five. Be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas, where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. Six. If a robber threatens you at home or on the street, try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can, and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note: keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong, but make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviors which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.